major figure, probably the most uh, decisive and clear-headed of all the hierarchs at the time in terms of resisting the innovation was the Metropolitan Petrograd Joseph. Metropolitan Joseph, we're going to talk a few, little, a few words about his, just, just a few words about his life uh, because of his, uh, the major role he played before we go on to read his, uh, some of his comments. Uh, so in 27, again, Sergius is released and his declaration. And then on September, just two months later, he transfers Metropolitan Joseph and Petrograd to Odessa. Because Metropolitan Joseph was the most decisive, the quickest, and the most uh, clear in his response and his resistance to Sergius. So he's the first one to, to receive the heavy-handedness, the totalitarian transfer from his diocese without any reason, you know, canonical reason. You know, bishops can disagree. <laughs> You can't do, you're not a pope to transfer people left and right. Anyway, he transfers Metropolitan Joseph from Petrograd to Odessa, probably under the pressure of the Bolsheviks. Yes, certainly. Metropolitan Joseph immediately refused the transfer, calling it anti canonical, ill advised, and pleasing to an evil intrigue in which I have no part. So he's absolutely decisive. Surgeon so stated in place Metropolitan Joseph on the ban. It was tried and forcefully retired, all of which Mr. President Joseph ignored. All right, so he's totally ignoring Sergius, and Sergius is banning him and retiring him like he's going to do to several bishops. Uh, and he, Joseph is ignoring it. We'll see how quickly the secret police come to help out Metropolitan Sergius in his desire for removing his main critic. Now, just to note, St. Joseph was glorified by the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia in 1981. Interestingly, he's not been recognized, to my knowledge, I might be wrong on this, but from my research, he was not recognized as a saint in Moscow, in the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, his feast day is November 30th. Now, that's very interesting. Why wasn't he recognized as a saint in Moscow? After his arrest again on the 12th of September, 1930 now, all right, so he, we jumped a little bit, but he's now 1930, Mr. Brother Joseph, I'm just giving you a little bit from his life so you know what happens. Mr. Brother Joseph was convicted on the following uh, September 3rd, 1931, of being the leader of the Church Administrative Center of the All-Union Counter-Revolutionary Monarchist Organization, quote, the True Orthodox Church, unquote. He was sentenced to five years in camps, a sentence that was to exile him to the desert of Kazakhstan for five years. So these are the accusations of the Soviets, uh, which, you know, always uh, take with a grain of, grain of salt. Uh, on June 4, 24, 1937, Mr. Paul and Joseph was arrested on a charge of counter-revolutionary activity. Again, years later, and he was executed on November 20th, 1937, along with Metropolitan Cyril, or Kirill of Kazan, and other bishops like Eugene of Rostov and others. This was during the great purge of Stalin when many bishops. So that's just a highlight of his uh, future suffering uh, and uh, the path of confession that he will, he will suffer. You'll note, again, Metropolitan Sergius did not suffer, did not go to prison, uh, but was um, in his uh, armchair until 45, 46, made a patriarch under uh, with the blessing of Stalin. So that's quite a different path. Um, again, we can definitely be sympathetic to every one of those who could not resist. We may and we all potentially can be a Judas. No one should speak haughtily about anyone. However, we have to say, God forbid, we don't, where the truth lies, who imitated Christ and who did not. Uh, we have to point to the ones who followed Christ to Golgotha. That's our absolute need here. God forbid we do not do that. We, 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 we shirk that responsibility. Now he goes on. Uh, 
it became immediately clear that the declaration was in flagrant defiance of the 34th apostolic canon. You know, some say, well, there's no canons broken by the Metropolitan Surgeons. Well, actually, there were. There were canons trampled upon. The 34th canon is one of the most important because it says clearly that the first, and he's not even the first again, remember, he's just a deputy, but the first has to do everything, the consent of all, and all have to do everything with the consent of the first. This, this is a key conciliar cornerstone, a basic principle in Orthodox conciliarity, which is, again, being trampled upon, not just back in the 30s and 20s, but now in the Orthodox Church by certain hierarchs. <clears throat> they have to do everything in consent. That's how we maintain the faith and the, and the, and the unity of the church. So he did not do that. Uh, and he, he have, uh, without the consent of all the bishops, he proclaimed being indeed the work of Sergius alone, the declaration, at the dictation of the atheist regime. And therefore the only ecclesiastical course open for Sergius was to retract the declaration in the face of such overwhelming disapproval of his fellow hierarchs. Instead of this, however, as if to prove that he no longer considered or needed the opinion of the church, what does that remind you of? Vatican I, maybe? Like, he can, he can, you know, without reference to the church, he can declare things and maybe speak infallibly. Uh, they no longer considered or needed the opinion of the church, but had become the obedient tool of the regime. He began, together with his uncanonical synod, the formation of which far exceeded his powers as substitute of the locum tenens, an unparalleled transference of bishops from sea to sea and placed under interdict all who did not agree with him, founding thus a submissive, quote, Soviet, unquote, church. So this is an excerpt from the uh, life of St. Joseph in the Catacomb Saints. Uh, so a lot of a lot of important material here. This is very important basic facts here that you have to consider when you're looking at this and the subsequent history. Uh, didn't have the powers to do all that, so none of it is legitimate. Those powers were not, not given to him. He was a usurper, usurper of all those powers, and he was um, you know, transferring bishops and placing interdicts and all this because he had the Soviet power behind him, but not because he had the church's approval and blessings. Uh, of course, going to create a lot of problems, including people ceasing your commemoration. Now, this is actually from St. Joseph in his letter uh, to, uh, to another. Those who defend Sergius say that the canons allow separation from a bishop only for heresy, judged by a sobor, so he's talking about Canon 15, which is an important canon in how we deal with heresy. It can be replied for that the actions of the Metropolitan Sergei have led to just that state, indeed. If one has in view such clear destruction of the freedom and dignity of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, One Holy Conciliar uh, and Apostolic Church, he says, but, and to drive home the point, we need a conciliar governance. But beyond this, there is much that the canons cannot foresee. And one, can one dispute the fact that it is worse and more dangerous than heresy when a knife is plunged into the very heart of the church, her freedom and dignity? Which is worse, heresy or murder? Uh, well, well said. Uh, obviously, uh, his actions were, and the times were unprecedented. His actions were unprecedented. His denial of the canons were clear. So he was innovating. Uh, usurping and all the rest. Uh, I think there's ample uh, ample space canonically for one to, because there's no even desire to work together and listen and to repent and change this course, that the succession of commemoration is in the spirit of uh, the Canon 15, even if it's not literally what the Canon says, it's Canon says that one has to preach a condemned heresy in order for one to legitimately cease commemoration of that bishop. But as he says here, what he was doing was beyond a, a, a question of heresy of, uh, you know, the Holy Trinity or Christ divinity or anything like else. This was a, 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 a apostasy from the church, its meaning. So it wasn't, a, it's an heretical, it was an heretical stance uh, that he had assumed 
Uh, and uh, of course, the circumstances being as such as they were with the uh, uh, Soviet power uh, also made things extremely difficult. So uh, what's interesting is that all of these saints say that we submit ourselves to a future council for judgment. And of course, they said all of this has to end there. And so again, that's in the spirit of Canon 15. Canon 15 is clear that when they cease commemoration of your bishop or, or bishop of the patriarch, it's not an end in itself. It's not to create a new church. It's not to create schism. It's to cease there being a schism because heresy creates a schism from God and from the saints and from the patrician tradition to bring that to an end. And But the means and the method there is always conciliar. So the point is to bring that before the, the, the conciliar mind of the church, the bishops, and for it to be judged and to be uh, uh, to be either condemned if it's unrepentant, the person's unrepentant, or to be uh, for the person to repent or, or whatever, uh, for it to be judged. And that's the spirit of Canon 15. So he's again, and all the saints were in that spirit. They were not in the spirit of haughtiness and schism schismatic uh, mentality, as you'll see, but they were, they were begging him to stop. And they were, they were saying all of this needs to be referred to a future synod, which will judge whether our actions were appropriate. So that's, I think, very much in the spirit of uh, not only the fathers and not only because there's an extenuating circumstance, but because it's actually the canonical literature points to that kind of stance. Didn't, didn't, doesn't mean that they were seeking or starting out to, to create parallel jurisdictions, to create a schism. Again, that's not the spirit of them or the canon. So I think that, that there's a good case to be made there in the spirit of the canons, the saints, of course. Uh, so he goes on. The interdictions of Metropolitan and Sergius were the sign for the Soviet political police to arrest and ban the protesting bishops. Even many who attended Serge's own legal churches were not spared by the authorities, and the chief result of the police of policy of Sergianism was that Metropolitan Serge's actions saved nothing except his own skin. This is a quote from a later um, representative of the uh, uh, resistance in the Moscow Patriarchate in uh, the 1960s. But that's his estimation. I think it's something that many people share, uh, that he saved nothing except his own skin or his synod skin, or uh, however you like to say it, or the church buildings. Uh, so uh, now this is from the Catacomb Saints. A dark night of expi expiatory, expiatory suffering settled upon the Russian land and faithful. Paul and Joseph, by his decisive words and acts, and by his position as one of the substitutes of the local tenants of the patriarchal throne, became the factual head of the separatist movement, acting in the name of the banished local tenants, Metropolitan Peter, whose anti surgeonist attitude was not to become known for some time. So initially, there was not decisiveness or decisions coming down from Peter because he was in exile, and Metropolitan Joseph essentially uh, stepped in the gap, filled the gap. The influence of Metropolitan Joseph was so powerful that all who followed him came to be labeled, of course, by the detractors as Josephites. Uh, so that's not the first time in church history that there'll be a derogatory name for the saints. And we can remember that the Kolivali's fathers, uh, not speaking here uh, positively, they're saying this is a schismatic uh, tendency. So they want to. They don't want to call it by the name of faithful Christians, but by Josephites, that people are just following him and not Christ, which is a slander, of course. 